this allows us to study the maintenance phase of tolerance and to um, ask whether once established tolerance is stable or if there are any challenges that could threaten its stability and the ability of patients to retain a graft for the rest of their lives. And we're asking that because we have um, questions that come from the clinic. This is from a study by Sophie Douar in France a few years ago, in which she followed kidney transplant recipients that had become tolerant uh, spontaneously, um, not sure why um, they were able to withdraw immunosuppression, but they were able to stop taking all their immunosuppressive medications for at least one year. And she followed these 27 patients for a period of 10 years and looked at their grafts. And over this period, two thirds of the patients remained tolerant while one third lost their tolerance. And one thing that we noted was different between these two groups is that the patients who lost their tolerance had a higher incidence of viral and bacterial infections preceding their graft rejection. And so that leads to the question of whether once a graft is stably uh, accepted and either tolerant or maybe on minimal immunosuppression, can infections trigger the rejection of a previously tolerated allograft? Um, to ask that question, we use our mouse model of donor-specific tolerance. We let the graft be accepted, and then we infected the mice 60 days after transplantation with Listeria monocytogenes. That's a, a, a severe infection in mice that induces a lot of inflammation. And we saw that indeed, Listeria infection could cause the rejection of established allografts in a subset of the recipients. It's usually between 50% uh, or 40% and, and 60%. And this breaking of tolerance, this graft rejection, correlates with um, uh, um, detectable allogreactivity. Um, maybe the organizers can mute. Thank you. Um, so the rejection was correlated with increased detection of allogreactivity to the donor in terms of interferon gamma production. And also the graft had fewer infiltrating uh, or, or a lower proportion of regulatory cells, um, not because there were fewer numbers of regulatory cells, but because there's a, an influx of alloreactive cells. And so the proportion of T regs to conventional T cells uh, got lower in the infected mice compared with the tolerant mice. And then in data that I am not going to show, we found that type 1 interferon and IL-6 were necessary for Listeria to be able to break tolerance and were sufficient. If you combined injections of interferon beta and IL-6, that could trigger rejection even in non-infected mice. So clearly, a strong inflammatory challenge can drive rejection. So then how can we study really the, the yellow reactivity of that and the T cell fate? We wanted to know what happened to the T cells during the induction, the maintenance, and the loss of tolerance. And we wanted to be able to track graft reactive T cells. So for that, we used a T cell receptor transgenic um, mouse line that's called TCR75, where the T cells are uh, specific for a peptide derived from MHC class one from the dot. So when we transplant a heart into a, an allogeneic recipient, MHC class one, here in the mouse it's called K of, B, uh, K of D, sorry, uh, is picked up by a host antigen presenting cell and the MHC class one protein is chopped into peptides that are presented by MHC class two of the host to the CD4 positive TCR75 cell. So it's specific for a peptide derived from donor MHC class one. And what we wanted to know is, okay, we're going to inject these cells into a recipient mouse and use them as tracer of the alloreactive response. Um, we're going to treat the mouse with anti-CD154 and uh, a heart transplant, allo antigen. And we want to know, do these T cells persist? 
do they become memory, but then they're suppressed by regulatory cells, or do they become dysfunctional? So we seeded a number of TCR75 cells into recipient mice at the time of transplantation, induced tolerance, or let the mice reject, and then waited for a month or two for memory, in this case, to uh, develop or tolerance to be well established. And we analyzed the phenotype and function of TCR75 cells by flow cytometry. And two markers that we use to assess for generation of memory are CD127, which is IL-7 uh, receptor alpha, and PD-1. And you can see that the TCR75 cells from the mice that rejected, so these at this time point, these are memory T cells, they're high in CD127 and low in PD-1. However, the T cells from the tolerant mice are low in CD127 and high in PD-1, which is more reminiscent of effector cells or uh, chronically stimulated cells. So they certainly don't acquire a phenotype of memory. And then in terms of function, we re-stimulated these cells uh, with um, anti-CD3 and anti-CD28. And you can see that they lose function. They uh, have a reduced capacity to produce interferon gamma and TNF compared to the memory T cells from the rejecting mice. So the allospecific T cells in tolerant mice persist, they don't all die, but they do not acquire a memory phenotype and they are hyporesponsive. So they don't become memory, they seem to become dysfunctional. And in terms of dysfunction, what are the possibilities um, by which these cells could become dysfunctional? They could become anergic because we're blocking co-stimulation. So the cells are receiving signal one in the absence of co-stimulation. Or they could become exhausted because we have the graft that persists and as a source of antigen. And so these cells are being hit in the head or on their T cell receptor repeatedly. Um, and this could lead to exhaustion of the T cells. Um, so to test this, we uh, decided to remove the graft at different times after transplantation to see if persistence of this antigen simulation was necessary for the dysfunction. We transplanted the mice, we induced tolerance, and then we removed the graft on day seven or on day 21 after transplantation, um, waited for a little bit longer, and then retrieved the TCR75 cells that we had seeded at the time of transplantation. And we analyzed their function in an assay that we call recall proliferation, where we can transfer either the tolerant T cells or the memory T cells from the mice that rejected into recipient hosts that are naive. And we re-stimulate these T cells in these hosts with donor antigen. And we analyzed their recovery at day five. Um, and so it's very clear that the recovery of the T cells that were tolerant when we stimulated uh, is much less than the recovery of the cells that came from mice that had rejected and have memory TCR75 cells. So these cells are tolerant. However, if we remove the graft seven days after transplantation, we prevent the induction of tolerance uh, as um, read out by this, uh, this assay. But if we leave the heart for 21 days and then remove it, this reduced recall proliferation is induced. So the graft has to stay for you know, at least two or three weeks for this dysfunction to happen. Um, removing the graft at an early time point prevents cell dysfunction during co-stimulation blockade. And we can look at uh, the function of TCR75 cells analyzed at different times after the induction of tolerance, day seven to day 60. And you can see that there's a really nice dose dependent loss of function in the same assay of recall proliferation, the longer the T cells have been exposed to the, to the heart transplant. Um, okay, so from this part, the conclusions are that alloreactive T cells in tolerant mice persist. 
but they're dysfunctional. They seem to be, you know, looking like exhausted cells. They fail to acquire memory phenotype. Uh, we know that persistent antigen is necessary uh, in the form of the graft for this T-cell dysfunction to be established. And then that leads to a question, if alloreactive T-cells in these tolerant mice are so dysfunctional, how can we get rejection after the steria monocytogenous infection? What is happening with this very inflammatory infection um, to trigger rejection. We know that hysteria triggered rejection is T-cell dependent. Are we reawakening the cells that are like the PCR75 cells, recognizing MHC class one or peptides derived from MHC class one? Or is the rejection triggered by another set of alloreactive T-cells that perhaps do not become as dysfunctional as the TCR75 cells? And what we're thinking is that maybe not all antigens, not all alloantigens are expressed um, at the same level and for the same duration of time as donor MHC class one. Uh, and we're thinking in particular of MHC class two. And we can track um, T cells that are specific for a peptide derived from donor MHC class two because we have another uh, TCR transgenic mouse line that's called TEA. Mm -hmm. um, and what we think is going on is that when you transplant a heart, you're going to have, of course, donor MHC class one here in purple expressed on all cell types for the duration of the life of the graft. However, MHC class two of the donor is going to be expressed on antigen presenting cells and on inflamed endothelial cells after uh, ischemia reperfusion injury. But over time, the donor antigen presenting cells are going to die. And so that source of donor MHC class two is going to disappear. And then the MHC class two on the endothelial cells um, is going to be downregulated once the inflammation after transplantation subsides. And so these TE cells may receive an initial uh, stimulation for maybe one, two, perhaps three weeks, but no longer. But then we think that um, we know that interferon gamma can induce re-expression of MHC class two and endothelial cells. And we think that perhaps this area infection would induce re-expression of MHC class two um, in infected mice, and therefore, the class two peptide reactive T cells would be able to re-engage their cognate antigen and perhaps trigger rejection. So um, how can we, we test that? And is, is that true? This slide is a little bit complicated, but if you just look here, we wanted to know um, how much antigen was present um, at a late time point after transplantation um, and, and looking at MHC class one or MHC class two. And so what we did is transfer CFSC labeled class two reactive or class one reactive T cells and analyze them for CFSC dilution, which marks proliferation of the cells four days after transfer. And so if you look at the legends here, this is clear. If you transfer the cells into untransplanted mice, CFSC levels are high and they don't divide. If you transfer them into untransplanted mice but challenge with donor alloantigen, they both divide perfectly fine. Now, if you transfer them into mice that are rejecting um, three days after rejection, when MHC class two and class one is, is high, both the class two reactive cells and the class one reactive cells are dividing. But if you transfer them into tolerant hosts, now you can see division of the class one reactive cells because class one is uh, expressed throughout the life of the graft, but much less proliferation of the class two reactive cells. This is not because they are suppressed by the tolerant environment, because if you add donor alloantigen, they can proliferate. And so it's likely because there's less MHC class two available for these naive transport cells 
to drive, to, to see their cognitive antigen and proliferate. So does that have an impact on the function? The fact that MHC class two expression in the donor is less persistent than MHC class one? Would TEA cells then, if they were present from the beginning of transplantation, become less dysfunctional than uh, TCR75 cells? And sorry, they should say TCR75. 75 has disappeared. Um, so to address their function, now we're transferring TCR75 or TEA cells at the time of transplantation. So they're induced to become memory if the mice are not treated, or they're induced to become tolerant if the mice are treated. And we're analyzing their surface phenotype and their function. And you can see that as before, the TCR75 cells from the tolerant mice lose their ability to produce TNF and interferon gamma, but the MHC class two reactive T cells retain their ability to produce some TNF, although they lose the ability to produce interferon gamma. Um, and also in this other assay that I described before, the recall proliferation in host mice, the TCR75 cells have a very reduced recall proliferation but the TEA cells retain their ability to proliferate again to um, donor alloantigen stimulation. So they're less dysfunctional than the class one reactive cells. So what happens after listeria infection when we induce tolerance and then we infect with listeria? We can look at the graph to see if listeria indeed induces a regulation of MHC class two. And you can see that yes, in the tolerant mice, there is much less expression of MHC class two in the graft than uh, during acute rejection, so very early after transplantation. But in the tolerant mice that are infected at this late time point, MHC class two is reinduced. And this results in proliferation of the class two reactive TEA cells, but not in proliferation of the class one reactive um, TCR75 cells. And these cells were seeded at the beginning during transplantation. So then, um, you know, is there a way that we could make these class two reactive T cells more dysfunctional? And we thought since dysfunction depends on chronic antigen stimulation, instead of stimulating with just one dose of uh, donor stenocytes and alloantigen, we can stimulate these cells every other day with repeated doses of donor alloantigen. And we actually injected them 18 times every other day so for, for uh, 36 days, and then recover them and look at their TNF production. And now this uh, multiple exposure to donor antigen results in um, reduced expression finally of these class two reactive cells to make TNF and reduced recall proliferation. So we have a way to make them more dysfunctional. Would this regimen work to protect the grafts from hysteria? And it seems to indeed protect the grafts, where you can see that if we only uh, do our normal regimen, which is anti-CD154 with one dose of donor splenocytes, there's a lot of inflammatory uh, nodules here of infiltrating cells. But if we give our chronic stimulation uh, of donor splenocytes with anti-CD154, the graft seems very good. And by histology, there's much less um, rejection grade and much, much uh, less um, rejection score uh, quantifying the vas perivascular infiltrate and myocyte damage. So we seem to be able to protect the grafts. So in conclusion, um, what I've told you is that donor MHC class two is down regulated up to transplantation, but can be reinduced by infections such as hysteria monocytogenes. That T cells that are reactive to peptides derived from donor MHC class two are less dysfunctional than T cells that are specific for MHC class one derived peptides but we can make them more dysfunctional by repeated exposure to their cognate antigen. And this new regimen now can protect the grafts from infection triggered rejection.
And so the overall conclusion, these are data that I haven't shown you, but since you asked me to talk about tolerance after anti-CD4, TCD4 T lag and blockade, we think that uh, this treatment can induce tolerance um, features at the population of cells wide, at the cell-cell interaction, and at the cell intrinsic level. Um, I didn't talk about this data, but anti-CD4 T ligand, anti-CD154, prevents the expansion of high avidity clones that are more prone to causing rejection. At the cell-cell interaction level, we're increasing the ratio of regulatory T cells. Um, and I didn't show you the data, but we're also increasing the susceptibility of, co of conventional cells to T-Rex suppression. And then at the cell intrinsic level, we induce dysfunction um, that looks like exhaustion of graph reactive cells, but not of the whole T cell repertoire. And so we need another approach to induce this function of a wider array of alloreactive T cells. Um, and that's what I wanted to tell you. These are the people uh, from my lab over the years who have worked on this project of, of tolerance, uh, especially Michelle Miller, uh, Christine McIntosh, and Jenna Loco, um, and Ying and Luchu are my microsurgeons. Ying is doing all the, the heart transplantation data. And everything that I've told you is in very, very close collaboration with Anita Chong. Um, we have a, a joint program project grant together and joint lab meeting uh, every week and all the experiments are, are discussed together. So thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions.